Funding for this program is provided by the National Institute for Spectral Haptics. Additional funding is provided by Progenicom, makers of spiritual interface technologies, and by viewers like you. Thank you. In the rugged mountains of western Wyoming, a job is getting done. With quiet confidence and pride, these men and women stand on the shoulders of those who came before them. They work for something greater than themselves. They work for the people of the United States. As the keepers of this nation's legacy, they work to keep a promise. A promise to maintain the spiritual infrastructure of this country. A promise to keep the living safe and the dead at peace. A promise to forge new paths forward in our understanding of occult science and in the exploration of astral space. That promise began in one of the darkest chapters of human history. The lingering effects of a civil war, decades of racial and economic inequality, a brutal war in Europe, and an unprecedented financial crash left the American people in the depths of a depression. Men are desperate for work. Families struggle to feed their children. Many are forced to leave their homes. Franklin Delano Roosevelt wins the presidency on the promise of relief but it will be a difficult road to recovery. This nation is asking for action, and action now. During his first 100 days in office, over 70 laws and executive orders were passed, all in an attempt to halt the death spiral of the American economy. A series of public work projects called the New Deal are created to provide work for the millions of unemployed U.S. citizens. The largest of these programs were the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and the Works Progress Administration, which built roads, bridges, airports, hospitals, and schools. While not as well known as these famous programs, hundreds of smaller organizations were also established to tackle specific problems. One of these lesser programs, the NRS, would end up leaving a mark on world history. The final days of the American Civil War witnessed a Confederate states resorting to desperate measures as a Northern victory loomed. Under intense pressure, leaders of the Southern War effort turned to a small and secretive order of white supremacist mystics who professed a knowledge of arcane sorcery that could turn the tide of the war. With resources and equipment supplied by wealthy Southern sympathizers, an elaborate ritual was executed over several weeks early in 1865. The goal of this ritual was to cripple the Union Army by summoning a catastrophe of biblical proportions, but no such destruction occurred. Historians are still unsure of the exact cause of the error, but the ritual did not work as intended. Instead of igniting Union cities in a blaze of white fire, a quiet darkness was planted further north in the quiet forests of New England. The South, in turn, was defeated by the Northern Army, and the war officially ended in May. The revelation of the South's official use of sorcerers caused a minor scandal in the following years, but the controversy was quickly forgotten during the frenetic years of Reconstruction. As the nation grappled with the new challenges presented by the outcome of the war, the lights of the Northeast began to go dark. Coastal fishing villages began to disappear as their waters became devoid of sea life. Entire old growth forests began to turn black and sickly. Experts were baffled and the region's lumber industry began to wither until towns were left empty and desolate. 
those who attempted travel into the region found roads and waterways overgrown, with many individuals disappearing altogether. Authorities insisted that economic decay and rampant crime were at fault, but superstitious rumors of curses and black magic persisted as a fascination with spiritism in the occult swept over the nation. Thus, in 1939, compelled by reasons of both pragmatism and public interest, the Roosevelt administration deemed it necessary to solve the problem of the Northeast. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously, treating the task as we would treat the emergency of a war. Using the power of eminent domain, FDR authorized the creation of the Northeastern Reclamation Service, or the NRS. The NRS was a civilian organization tasked with identifying, surveying, and redeveloping lands and properties which had otherwise been left abandoned in the states of Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and parts of upstate New York. Thousands of young men cleared and rebuilt roads, established modern electrical infrastructure, and bulldozed abandoned structures during the initial months of the reclamation effort. Morale was high, and it was estimated that the project might be completed by the early 1940s. However, as NRS crews moved further north, the workers encountered a new problem. Many of the structures were haunted. Skepticism was high among program administrators, but as delays, worker disappearances, deaths, equipment damage, and other effects manifested, the problem had to be confronted. Members of the clergy were consulted, and when they could not offer any substantial solutions, a task force of officially sanctioned individuals with experience in the occult were assembled to develop possible solutions. While early experiments were fruitful, the bombing of Pearl Harbor in the United States' subsequent entry into the Second World War siphoned resources for the war effort and brought the work of the NRS to a halt. In 1945, Nazi Germany surrendered to Allied forces in Europe, and it was discovered that secretive groups within the German High Command had also developed a practical interest in occult matters. By carefully studying folk practices from the Black Forest region of modern Bavaria, German engineers had developed a prototype machine which was intended to act as a beacon to focus and direct cryptic and powerful spiritual phenomena into a super weapon. While ultimately ineffective, the capture of both the weapon and its designers during Operation Paperclip was celebrated as a success for the developing field of occult science. Before the war, demolition of haunted structures by the NRS had only driven spirits to aggression. But by the 1950s, a plan had been devised. Using new technologies developed by both American and former German scientists, spirits could now be contained in a process called sequestration. Early containment attempts were primitive, but demonstrated promise. In 1956, President Eisenhower signed the Federal Occult Management Act, which reorganized the Northeastern Reclamation Service into an independent executive agency. This new agency, the Federal Occult Range Management Administration, or FORMA, consolidated both the research and executive efforts of federal occult science across the nation. FORMA's first goal was to develop a method to safely house displaced spirits so that they did not pose a health risk to the greater population. A concentrated program of research and experimentation led to the construction of the first spirit habitat in St. Louis, Missouri in 1958. By 1960, there were plans to construct habitats within every major American city. Urban renewal efforts during this time made locations within city centers affordable and close to vital infrastructure, while also distancing these habitats from the growing suburbs. America's fascination with the occult had grown from curiosity to obsession, as much of Forma's activities were made public. Many groups were critical of the government's involvement with spiritual affairs, while others began to see opportunity. 
books were published which claimed to offer detailed instructions for communicating with spirits contained within inner city habitats, with mixed results. To curb the spread of misinformation, Forma established a program of professional training, qualification, and licensure for mystic practitioners. Meanwhile, the concentration of spirits within inner cities had an unintended consequence, the attraction of non-human spirit entities called phantophores. These non-corporeal organisms, known in folklore as monsters, devils, or demons, feed upon the spiritual essence which comprises apparitions. While normally indifferent to human life, the attraction and illegal conjuring of these spiritual predator organisms drives them to begin attacking living prey, as spirit habitats are designed to withstand phantivore incursion. Disaster was inevitable. Remember today as the Mardi Gras Massacre, a willful evocation of phantivores during the New Orleans Mardi Gras celebration of 1966 led to the horrific deaths of 58 people. In response to the tragedy, President Johnson created a federal task force charged with investigating and preventing urban examples of demonic activity. During the Nixon administration, federal funding to Forma was increased, while the counter-demonic task forces were unified under a new federal paramilitary organization, the Special Counter-Apparitional Regulation and Enforcement Agency, or SCARE. The negative effects of inner-city spirit habitats are the subject of ongoing debate, so a decision is made to explore possible long-term solutions. Responding to a request for proposal, the eclectic and enigmatic architect Ansel Suleiman presents Forma with a proposal for a colossal superhabitat to be constructed at a remote location away from population centers. This proposed superhabitat would be capable of housing many times the then estimated number of sequestered apparitions. The proposal is approved, with a site in rural Wyoming chosen. Construction of the Wyoming superhabitat was finished in 1981 and remains the largest non military installation ever built. By 1982, the interstate apparitive transmission system began to transport sequestered spirits from inner city habitats to the Wyoming site. All of the spending was not without criticism, however. I believe in separation of church and state, but I don't think you can separate God from America. A vocal coalition of Christian voters began to petition President Ronald Reagan to reduce government spending on occult activities. As a result, Forma was directed to transition into a self-funding model. It is time to check and reverse the growth of government, which shows signs of having grown beyond the consent of the governed. Additionally, watchdog agencies were created to monitor government paranormal program spending and deficits. Today, Forma is pioneering new forms of occult applications. Automated seance machines, or ASMs, have been constructed by the thousands across the United States. For a small fee, users are able to utilize a hardline connection to the spirit world, backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. As the 21st century quickly approaches, new technologies and methods of spirit interface communications continue to be tested and developed to advance the science of spectral haptics. As these techniques become more affordable, advancements in private industry promise possibilities beyond imagination. To tackle these challenges, a new generation of hardworking men and women will be needed to bring bold new ideas to the field of occult management. Even now, the National Institute for Spectral Haptics is engaging in a new program of education and outreach to engage young people in matters of the occult. In facilities across the United States, Forma is keeping its promise of safe and sustainable occult management for the people. Yesterday, today and tomorrow.